for the technical issues. We are just waiting to get, I think, uh, three or four more participants uh, back to the original number we had. So we're going to give it uh, about two more minutes and then we'll continue with the events. Uh, apologies for this. Patience. Um, I think I'm going to kick on uh, and just carry on with with the meeting from here. Um, as as a couple more people join, I'm aware that uh, we've actually grown. Even though we're back to 25 participants, there are a couple of people outstanding who will presumably or hopefully be joining in a little bit. So what I'm going to do though is um, uh, with the current group that are sitting in the room. Uh, if I can go through some other statutory requirements, uh, which is the adoption of the previous AGM's minutes. If you, you see that you have a way of raising your hand, uh, if I can get uh, somebody to propose and somebody to second that proposal, but let's, let's go for a proposal first, please, from the floor of last year's minutes. Okay, I see your hand up in physical space, Joan. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so Joan Parker um, has, uh, and Kari, thank you, Kari. Then I'll take that as, a, as seconding the, vote, the, the minutes. So thank you for that. We will adopt last year's minutes as they were sent out. Um, then I'm going to now hand over the mic, although I will share my screen um, to our uh, financial guru Grant, um, who I believe is in the room. I can't see him now that I start talking about it. Is he here, Kyron? I see you. We have we have two pages of people, Phil. So so he's yeah, yeah, well, I scrolled across, but I can't I can't see I can't see him. I'm but okay. Um, ah, there we go. I can hear you now. All right. Yeah. So let me share my screen, Grant, uh, and okay. you can take us through uh, the. Uh, finances, please. Let me just get to that. Let me get to that page in a minute. Right, Grant, you just need to okay. take the floor and let me know when to change screen for you. Right. Can you go, can you go down one? Can you? That's page three. Can you go to page four? One, one page down. Let me do the, let me do the income statement first. Okay. I'll carry on down. Yep. Uh, perfect. There we go. Okay. Oh, well, thank you very much. And as I said, this is a, a unique uh, way of actually doing a presentation. Normally, I'm standing up in front of uh, a group of a group of members at the Vineyard Hotel for the last couple of years. Now I'm sitting in front of my PC. Anyway, the um, income and expenditure statement. Just going through some of the um, on the income compared to last year. Last year, our our total income was just over five hundred fifty thousand rand. Um, Majority of the money once again, and as you'll see that in 2020 as well, was the very generous um, grant that we have been getting from the Abex Foundation probably for about the last 10 years. I think the first time that we uh, received the grant, I was looking at my records just before the meeting, was in 2009. And in those days, it was still um, the Polaris Foundation. So. If it wasn't for if it wasn't for Abex, who really are our major um, beneficiary and sponsor, the work that the Friends of the Lisbeck are currently been doing for the last couple of years would not be able to um, would not be able to sustain the project. So I think at this stage I would like to make a special note of thanks to the Abex Foundation for their very generous um, gift. Other income is mainly in the, 
Uh, we also received a um, hundred thousand rand from the from uh, SA breweries, um, which unfortunately, <coughs> unfortunately, we are led to believe that obviously with the whole coronavirus and the fact that SAB is very much um, in a difficult situation regarding the um, the current, particularly the current uh, ban on alcohol or whatever, and they've had to be, um, they've, they've been through quite a big uh, retrenchment exercise as well. The uh, indications are that SAB will not be in a position to continue supporting us for 2020, 2021. So that's going to leave quite a significant um, dent in our um, income stream. So we would need to hopefully look at um, other, other um, sponsors to be able to pick up some of that, um, that shortfall. On the expenditure side, the um, expenditure side is pretty much in line with last year. Uh, last year's total expenditure was 620,000 whereas, Rand, whereas the year ending uh, March 20, 20, 2020 was 584,000 Rand. Now, the main saving was in the way of um, the team salary and wages. And one of the reasons mainly for that is we since about May, April, May last year, we have been one, we have been one person uh, short. Barbara went on maternity leave and, was, and, has, and had not been replaced. So that, that allowed us to actually pick up a little bit of a saving on the, um, on the, river, team, on the river team wages. Um, so in total, in total, whereas last year we, um, we posted a net loss of, of 66,000 Rand, this year, we've managed to post a net surplus of 85,000 Rand. Now, obviously, all of these things are up until the end of Oopsie. March, which is when we were still very much out of um, COVID-19. So our financial year was basically when we went into, was around about the time that we went into the first lockdown. So 2021 is going to be a significantly uh, more difficult year than 20 in 2020. Oh, sorry, my sister's not my video. Okay, so on the um, all right, okay, then, then Phil, if you can go up to the um, income up up to the balance sheet side, page just above that. Okay, that may, that shows us all, that shows us the picture where we are at the moment. The obviously the net surplus of eighty five thousand rand is part of the general general fund surplus, um, and the the net the net funds in the net funds in the bank as of the as of the thirty um, first of March was four hundred eighty six thousand rand in the uh, savings account. Up to six thousand rand in the money market account. Now you asked the question: Well, why have we got so much money in the um, savings account? The the the, uh, the simple reason for that is the Amex, the Amex money, which of five hundred thousand rand. That money was received just before the um, before the beginning of February. So, tradition, traditionally, as I say, we normally are very flush. Um, from a financial point of view at the end of the financial year, which does help us because the, the, main, the, the main source of funding is, um, is received, is received uh, in, the last, in the last few months of the financial year. The, the other thing I just want to highlight is the fact that we've still got, in our funds, we've still got just over 38,000 Rand sitting in, um, We've accumulated over the last couple of years for peninsula peninsula tunnels. Um, and last year, last year the um, the friends of the list we, we did do the peninsula paddle in September last year. However, there is a I'm not too sure what latest 
is re with regard to it, but the, there was a lot of talk at the time that, that that possibly some other organization would actually take over the the running and the mark and the marketing of the peninsula panel because and for the least bit under the um under the auspices of Kevin of Kevin uh, Winter has been involved in peninsula panel since 2014. So we uh, we feel, as I say, that it's, the time is the time is right to possibly hand over the organisation to another um, another organisation that has expressed interest in it. Over and above that, as I say, if there's other, if, if there's no further questions or nothing that more to be debated on the true financials itself, um, I need to obviously uh, table the financials for. Um, financial report for uh, acceptance at this AGM, and I probably need a, a proposal and a second, please. Thanks, Nick. With my screen sharing in this mode, I can see your hand up <clears throat> as either proposal or seconder. Um, I, I don't see everyone else's screen, so if, if someone else is on the grid view, you could just see if there's a if there's a follow up. Well, Kyron here, I, I'll second. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Kyron and Nick. Um, all right, we're going to adopt the the financials uh, as presented by Grant. Thank you very much, Grant, for one, your sorry, time. One last, sorry, sorry for one last thing that I did that I did admit. I would actually like to, at this stage, just um, express once again my gratitude, um, not only to the committee for their support this year, but particularly to um, our honorary bookkeeper, Liz Williamson, who has tirelessly, without, with, 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 as I say, pro bono uh, signs up to annual financial statement. And it's really, as I say, it's fantastic to have somebody that I can actually uh, work so closely with and just be able to drop off the financials and within a week they've been audited and uh, in, in this position. So I really I would like to um, express my gratitude to her for the, for, for the really good and honorary work that she's been doing for our organization. Thanks, Grant. That's noted in the minutes, and we we appreciate her very much for that work that she puts in for us for free. <clears throat> uh, normally, uh, we present her with a bottle of wine at this stage, but uh, this year being this year, we that option is no longer available to us. Uh, but rest assured, to the other participants, uh, we will we will honour her with with some sort of voucher um, as as we would normally. Um, I just want to ask Nick if uh, Councillor Iverson would be allowed to unmute so that uh, I believe he had a question to raise on this issue of finances. Mr Chair, can I go ahead? Yes, please. It's not so much questioning the finances, but it was raised during the presentation. It's an obvious thing in terms of your income. Basically, your this organisation has been dependent on two sources of income, two donations. And it's a, not a very good situation to be in. I believe this organization could certainly uh, attract donations going forward, but you actually have to sort out and create a fundraising program to bring money into your organization. And it's not something that you can casually talk about tonight and leave it open. It has to be a project that one somebody undertakes, researches, and moves forward. And I would hope friends of Elisbeck do take that up, because if somebody pulls the plug on your major large donation, quite frankly, you're in serious trouble being able to carry forward your good work. So I hope it's going to be, in terms of your committee meetings going forward, you will look to that aspect, how you can actually put a fundraising program in place. And maybe we can talk about it and what the city can also do. I'm not sure what the city's contribution could be, but at least I think it should be explored as well. Thank you. 
Great, thanks very much. Yes, that, that's uh, the obvious elephant in the room uh, with these finances. And uh, we really appreciate your input on that. We, we are aware as a committee, it has, um, it has formed a part of many of our uh, committee meetings, but I, I, we take on board your suggestion of having a more uh, formalized uh, fund seeking platform. So um, we, have, we have obviously relied on, um, uh, on members on our volunteer committee members to, to look into that from time to time. Um, and we've had some minor successes, but obviously nothing to the scale of, of replacing or at least duplicating the, the ABEX uh, donation. Um, yeah, it's, uh, and this year is certainly gonna make it a lot tougher uh, for, for going into next year for these kind of things. So thank you very much. We will, we will it'll certainly form a major part of our discussions in the next uh, couple of months uh, as a committee to try and uh, bolster that, uh, that fiscus. Thank you. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen for the moment uh, so that I can see the, the grid view on the Zoom meeting. Um, just to determine if uh, there are any other questions that anyone would like to raise at this stage before we move on. Phil, you are still sharing your screen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look at the top, look at the top. Yeah. That's Lewis Sparks is sharing the screen. That's what it tells me on mine. Yeah, me too. It says you are viewing Lewis Sparks' screen. Uh, and I'm not sure how that's happened. It's not, this is not my screen, Nick. Yeah, Nick, if you have it, look, okay, there, it's, it seems to have switched off now. Um, all right, so I'm just looking at the, the group to see if anyone else has a hand up or would like to uh, say anything at this stage about the, the finances. Um, I, don't see, I don't see anyone, I see general shaking of heads, people not keen to get involved in the finance discussion, that's, that's fine, <laughs> understandable. Um, so what I'm going to do now um, is hand over briefly to Sabelo, uh, who is our manager of the Leesbeck Maintenance Project, uh, to give his uh, version of the report for this year. Thanks, Sabelo. Sabelo, you need to unmute first, buddy. Hello, everybody. Okay, yeah, firstly, I just wish to say thank you um, to everybody for giving us um, uh, this platform um, uh, in trying to make something great out of the Lisbeck. Um, in terms of the report that I have, there is a link that I am going to share on the group um, that everybody can, can go to. It's a YouTube link. Um, you can go there and see the rest of the presentation. However, I've got a PowerPoint slide, which I will try to share or feel if you are able to share it for me um, from your side, um, just to show everybody a brief overview of what we have been able to achieve um, over this, this period. Is it viewable? All right. Can, can, is it visible? So, so you are sharing your screen, Sabella, but the presentation is not yet visible. I think you need to it's click on visible. that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I've shared it. Is it visible? I, I would suggest you, you share your entire screen, and then if you pull up the presentation, it should show. Okay. Done so. There we go. Okay, from my side, it seems quite a very tiny screen. 
Um, so I've got a series of pictures uh, that I just want to show everybody just to indicate what we've been able to achieve in the year. The first pictures are just basic uh, root, um, uh, routine maintenance uh, that we've been able to do um, in, 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 in the year, starting from last year's uh, post to last year's AGM. Um, this was somewhere, um, the, first, the picture on the left was somewhere around um, Lower Rose Bank. And the second picture on the right is at the ponds in front of Omni. And we were able to do some path maintenance along um, um, a college um, just um, be, uh, below um, um, uh, the Pick and Pay uh, Center in, in Rondebosch. And this is some, uh, partly some of the garden work that we've been able to do or introduce um, in the areas. And both pictures are pictures that we um, are drawing a picture of what we've been able to plant. We planted uh, platanthus uh, as well as um, uh, some bulbs for cover. And on the next one, uh, this is up around Kestenbosch Drive where, team, where the team was, able, was doing maintenance work. And on the next screen, this is just below um, Rokop um, Road where the team was, able, was doing uh, trimming works on the hedges as well as removing some invasive species as well as doing weeding works. Um, and this is at the Newlands, um, just below San Susi uh, Pools. And on this one, this is also in Newlands. You might be wondering why we're having such a lot of photos from Newlands. Um, this is basically because we have more before and after photos, but it's not an indication that our focus has been just on Newlands. And this is more pictures from the area around Rokop, but this is this year. And the picture on the left is an indication of what um, we came back to just after co um, um, when the COVID um, or coronavirus uh, regulations were, 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 were lifted. Um, there are also a number of community projects that we, we were able to do. And I think one that I take pride of is one that we were able to do with Sea Harvest, um, where we've pulled in Sea Harvest to partner with us um, in terms of delivering some of our key projects. And this year we did a, a Wetlands Environmental Day um, at, at, or at the pools in front of Omni. And yeah, on the next line, this is just an indication of other projects that we were able to do. There's a Mandela Day project that we did with WWF last year. There's a World Rivers Day uh, that we did with Adidas. Uh, and I think we received some income, just under 15,000 grand. And we were able to do some participatory work, participation work with community and schools of the Lisbic, where we have planted gardens along the Lisbic River and mainly uh, from Newlands and also assisted Francis of community with um, establishing of a garden uh, just uh, uh, behind um, um, Hayes Lukov, as well as just near Gordon's, um, um, Gordon's gym. And yeah, there's other things that we did uh, is that I did a presentation um, to CPUT students, Cape Peninsula University of Technology students, uh, just to pull in interest from university students because I felt that most of the interest was mainly from the locals, not necessarily from younger generations. And the presentation allowed us uh, to then um, uh, tell, tell young people that this is the kind of work that we do. Um, there's opportunities for you as university students um, um, to participate uh, at, at a voluntary level uh, with us. Uh, the screen that I'll, I'm sharing next is just pictures of the Mandela Day that we did with WWF at, in Athlone last year. And the next one is the one with the Adidas cleanup. There is a video attached um, to this presentation. Uh, unfortunately, I might not be able to play it just because of time, uh, but it can be, uh, the presentation can be available to you um, um, uh, to use at your perusal. And this one is the, just the outcome of what we had done with Sea Harvest at, um, and our sister groups um, in, the, uh, in the lower Rosebank um, Mowbray um, area. And yeah, some of these pictures that you are going to be seeing are going to be quite uh, uh, frightening of, of, of pictures because they depict um, the, the real impacts uh, of what uh, the team um, or of the real pollution impacts that 
uh, the team has to deal with it with to deal with on on daily basis and just this picture that is in front of you is a issue that we had last year with um, displaced people who had um, I'm just gonna go candidly and say stolen cables uh, from Metro Rail or the railway and decided to dissect them and dump the the casings in the river and that left that big clump which um, I think um, uh, covered almost about two, 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 three, uh, uh, no, a uh, hundred, uh, between 50 and 100 meters um, in distance. And there has been several events like last year's event um, that happened with Essex, um, which also impacted on the amount of hours the team spent um, um, doing river cleanups. And we were fortunate enough to have uh, people like John uh, Mustard and Jill Linham uh, help out uh, with the cleanups in, in, in the Lower Rosebank um, area. Um, and yeah, this is some of the piping um, casings that got left and a little bit of damage of what we had put out um, at the Lower Rosebank um, um, region um, in terms of refuse. And this is again, um, uh, displaced people um, looking for material that we've start, uh, we've taken out of the river to actually reuse for their own purposes. So this has been quite a common cycle um, at times, um, not necessarily from our own refuse, but from refuse uh, that has been collected by others where we've found uh, some plastic bags that are ripped open and actually end up in the river. Okay, and the next slide just shows an indication of the amount of litter that we've uh, pulled out from the river. And the blue is an indication of last year's um, refuse that was collected and the red or the pep or the maroon being this year's. You'll see that there's only three red um, bars on the screen uh, and the values are quite high. Um, and this also speaks to the um, COVID restrictions or the lockdown restrictions that uh, limited us in terms of doing work and the amount of litter that was generated in that period that ended up in the in the river canals. And this is more pictures of the state of the river just uh, after we had returned back and we also noticed that there were some concrete works and bricks that were thrown in the in the river canal in the surrounds. That's just more stuff that was being dumped and on the left of the screen um, particularly in this Rosebank uh, canal section there, we found that there's about four or five groups of people that were living in that section and were living the river in that, in that state. And on the right, that's something that I'm not proud to say or to say um, or to announce, but this actually happened in Newlands and we were quite surprised um, to see that some of the bags that we put out um, that um, are not collected in due course um, actually end up being taken and, and dumped along the, the river. Uh, and there are things that we tried doing with the team this year as well as last year. We tried taking out the team just for their own personal development um, to several sites this year. We took them, or last year, late last year, we took them to Kenilworth and Zandfle. Um They also got exposure uh, in participating with um, university researchers where we worked with um, researchers from UCT and Cambridge, um, just understanding uh, from the team um, what the work what the work means to them and how it's impacted their lives. And the research is soon going to be documented. And in one of the cleanups that we had last year, the one with um, Adidas and the Beach Co-op, um, Luleki, uh, uh, who's a team member, was actually fortunate enough to be interviewed uh, by Cape Town TV. And that um, that um, interview was um, uh, screened uh, sometime in October. I was also lucky um, in the same same cleanup um, to uh, be interviewed by Cape Town TV. Uh, well, not Cape Town TV, but Cape Town etc. Uh, regarding um, um, the litter or, or, or litter cleanups in Cape Town in general. That's the present. Uh, that's the video that I've shared that you guys can have um, access to later. Um, and in, ter in terms of COVID-19 um, impacts, um, we, greatly, we suffered greatly um, when, when it, 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 it took effect. 
um, in March. And in fact, prior lockdown, the committee decided um, to lay us off um, for our own safety reasons. And we, we were quite great, grateful for that. Uh, but uh, since then, we had a three month, uh, three months uh, layoff. Um, and then with a return in, in, in the beginning of June. Uh, with the return from the beginning of June, we had a stop start uh, uh, operation, uh, operation where we were unfortunate to have one of the team members um, testing positive for COVID-19, uh, which then meant we were then laid off for another 14 days um, off work. Um, it also gave me time to actually prioritize uh, or, or, or be strategic or think of strategic ways we can try improve the project um, while in my tenure. And I think on the next slide, you will see that, uh, uh, okay, not this one, uh, but I'll go to the next slide, just, but I just want, I want to touch on this. Uh, we are also able to uh, receive some positive um, during um, uh, this uh, pandemic where we've seen people like Peter van Aswachen, uh, who's a follower on our Facebook page and a somebody that contributes to some of our work, uh, posting uh, several pictures of fauna that he's seen on the Lisbeck and those have received quite a good following on our social media um, uh, pages. And as a result, including, well, notwithstanding some of our things that we've been putting on Facebook, but as a result, we've seen a 193 uh, following on, on the Facebook um, um, group page. Um, during uh, this period of lockdown, I was also able to uh, draw up or collate a flora and fauna data for the greater, what I call the Greater Lisbic um, Green Corridor. And I was able to determine that there is at least 432 confirmed species records along the Lisbic. And this is something that I think um, all of us can, 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 can look at it in, 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 at a, in a bigger picture as an opportunity that we, we, we could potentially use it um, to actually expand the project and move it along uh, from being rather from a, from a friends group uh, type group, but into a conservancy because personally I feel we are, there's a lot more that we can offer um, in terms of conservation and urban greening as well as um, um, uh, 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 contributing um, to, to, uh, to things like carbon sequestration in terms of what the habitat or the liver, uh, the, uh, the Lisbeth river, river offers um, generally in an urban context or the city of Cape Town. Uh, we we're also able to do some collaborative planning work with uh, community, community tree and, and, and sea harvest. And I think the community tree one is most important because there are projects that we might be introducing quite soon provided that we, uh, we, we, we nullify all the loopholes that, that we might be facing. But, it's generally around creating more gardens um, along the Lisbeth River. And we've, uh, Francis has already started work by introducing Erica uh, Vetisilata species along the Lisbeth, which would have occurred previously um, 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 or closer or along it. And this green is what I referred to as the um, Lisbeth Green Corridor um, and surrounds. Uh, I'm not sure if you are able to see it, but it, when you've received this presentation, you will be able to see um, what it entails, but, or, but you could also go onto the iNaturalist account and look for the Lisbeth Green Corridors and Surrounds, and it will give you an account of the species that, or the species numbers that I mentioned and, and how much the Lisbeth could potentially offer um, um, to the project. But otherwise, on behalf of the team, um, I would also like to thank Sea Harvest, who we received uniforms from um, uh, this year at a cost of about 8,000 rand, which we, the team was very grateful uh, for receiving. Um, just to close off, I just want to say thank you and acknowledge um, these following um, organizations and, and corporates who were, who were able to invest into the program. Um, just to mention a few, and the primary ones being ABEX Investment, uh, um, SAB Breweries Newlands. And I also want to say thank you to Aspire Solutions uh, for offering me office space, SandB, Sea Harvest, Adidas Beach Co-op, uh, WWF, Taffy, Expand, a Expand a Sign, who 
who gave us or who designed a signage for us uh, for free, which is the sign on the right of the screen. Also want to say thank you to, to SEPS and particularly the Rwanda Bosch, um, uh, the Rwanda Bosch uh, Community Police Forum group, as well as the schools uh, for the Lisbix uh, um, River as, uh, and um, to mention just a, a few people, which is Community Cape Bed Club and Kirsten Bosch Rotary Club. I thank you. That's great, Sabela. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well done to the team uh, and for doing all of this in in extraordinarily difficult times as well. It's, it's a real testament to the work ethic that uh, that the guys have. It's no small wonder that we refer to them internally as the dream team because uh, they're really quite keen to to get stuck in. <clears throat> And it's mucky work, but uh, they're really they're really good at it, and they're really passionate about what they do. Um, just a point of of clarity there. Uh, Sabella was talking about uh, during the the COVID lockdown that the, the team were laid off. Uh, that that might imply that that they were uh, retrenched or fired. That's not the case. Uh, what we did, what we did was uh, with in negotiation with the team, they initially went on a on a, a slight salary reduction. Uh, but just before the uh, initial lockdown and for a couple of weeks uh, inside that. Um, and I think inside of the second month, we, we decided that that wasn't really a sustainable option. So everybody remained at home, but, uh, but we remain, uh, remained on, on their full pay. So, so no one was, was laid off in the sense of being, uh, being uh, you know, fired. Everyone was just not on the river to, to avoid exposure to each other uh, and public transport and all that sort of thing. So I'll open the floor to anyone who wants to put their hand up if, if anyone has a question. Uh, thanks very much, uh, James Elam, in, your, in the comment section for your, uh, your thanks to the River team. Uh, we, we second that, it's a, real, it's a real privilege working with these men and women. Um, Okay, does anyone from the floor want to want to say anything or ask a question of Sabella before we move on to the main event? All right, seeming rather quiet. So then if I can pass the mic as it were to Kyron, please, to introduce our very interesting guest speaker for this evening's meeting. Thank, thank you very much, Phil. Um, this is a real treat for me. Uh, it's right up my alley. Um, I'm very, very happy and pleased to, to welcome uh, Dean Imsen to um, our AGM. Uh, welcome, Dean. You've been on the river with me personally when I was back as a project manager. And I think there's not a river in Cape Town or the, <laughs> the Berg River catchment that you probably aren't familiar with. But um, just a little back background in, in terms of um, our, our guest speaker tonight. Dean, Dean Ibsen is a, is a freshwater fish scientist. Uh, he has very recently retired from Cape Nature, uh, where he was the senior ichthyologist, um, which led him up to almost, I think, close on 30 years service for, for Cape Nature, which I think is remarkable in of itself. Um, Dean was a, was a, a, a rodent. Uh, he he <laughs> graduated with an MSc in ichthyology from Rhodes University and has uh, published, uh, I think it's 39 uh, scientific papers by my count uh, from my research. Um, but yeah, I think the, the main reason we asked Dean to come and, and chat to us this evening um, was his work um, on freshwater fish, which is his expertise. He's, a, he's renowned within certainly the Western Cape conservation circles as the preeminent uh, fish conservationist in freshwater systems. And uh, we asked him tonight to chat briefly on, firstly, just the indigenous fish species that we fi find in our greater catchment, which is the Berg River catchment, um, but with a particular focus on the Lisbjerg. Um, and I'm sure he's going to go into great detail about the history of, of, of the fish species in the river and what the future holds, which is quite exciting from, from Friends of the Lisbjerg perspective. Uh, so yeah, w without much further ado, I'd like to give the, the floor to Dean. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Karen, for that introduction. Um, I know it's been quite a long evening, um, but hopefully you enjoy the talk. Um, so yeah, you can 
bring up my presentation. Thanks very much. Okay, so uh, as has been mentioned, I'm going to just talk about the freshwater fish we found in the Berg River system and also the Lisbeck River, which will be of even more uh, interest to uh, your friends group. So yeah, if you can go to the next slide, please. So yeah, uh, so, yeah, yeah, I think uh, the Cape Curve at the bottom is a little bit cut off. So basically, if you look at the Berg River system, um, you, we all know the Berg River system pretty well, the vital system to Cape Town um, in terms of water supply and also in terms of socio-economic development. We've got four native or indigenous freshwater fish found in it, current, in terms of currently described, that's the berg white whitefish. Uh, it's undergone a name change recently, it used to be Barbus andrui, it's now Carlo Barbus capensis. It's an endangered species. It's only found in the Berg and Breda River systems, nowhere else in the world. Then there's the Berg River Redfin, a uh, very beautiful little fish. Um, that's an underwater photo of it, um, which you find, it used to be a lot more widespread, but now found in several tributaries of the Berg River. And I'll talk about the threats to these fish shortly. The Cape Kerpa is a, a classic uh, fame loss endemic found from Port Elizabeth all the way up uh, to the Berg River, for actually for fluorine plate catchment. But uh, uh, it's a data deficient species because a lot of uh, genetic work has been done on the Cape Kerpa and that's revealing that it's a species complex. Um, similarly, the Cape Galaxias, also a fame loss endemic, um, and very interestingly, uh, evidence of the supercontinent Gondwana land, because its closest relatives are in Chile, um, Australia, and New Zealand, also got Galaxias there. And that, uh, for many years, it was thought to be one species, but we're looking potentially at a species complex of 14 species going forward. Uh, very small fish. Uh, literally four, uh, five to seven centimeters long and um, gone pretty unnoticed uh, until recent years when Dr. Albert Chakona of the South African Institute of Aquatic Biodiversity started looking very carefully at them uh, and doing a lot of genetic work on them. So next slide please. So just looking at their habitat uh, requirements, uh, uh, Berg River Redfin, it's a small little fish. Um, the Redfin group all like unpolluted water. Uh, uh, I saw Sabella's presentation with all the uh, issues around pollution in the Lisbeck. Uh, certainly the Redfins would not like the middle and lower Lisbeck at the moment. So um, it, it requires a diverse habitat. I'll show you some photos. Uh, nice riparian zone and water temperatures preferably below 28 degrees with uh, again natural flows. Where you find red fins, it's a very good indicator of an ecologically healthy uh, uh, river. Uh, what the fish dislikes, it dislikes polluted waters, a lack of flow because of over abstraction, rivers that are bulldozed. Uh, we find that when rivers uh, have had too much summer flow abstracted, we finding the water getting way above 30 degrees and then uh, some of the more sensitive species actually uh, are no longer there in summer because of because of that and certainly alien fish uh, red fins do not like trout they do not like bass uh, because they are small fish generally up to uh, eight nine centimeters and are then preyed upon by these predatory invasive fish Galaxias, same thing, same likes as the, uh, as the redfin. Um, and that's why you find, if you look at the Lisbeck, you'll find that lots of Galaxias uh, around Kirstenbosch and below, just below Kirstenbosch where the water quality in the Lisbeck is good. Cape okay, Kerpa, more tolerant species, uh, can take warmer water, uh, light levels of pollution. Um, and the whitefish very much uh, growing up to 
three, four kilograms in weight, much bigger fish, um, and wanting large deep pools of the Berg River and the Breda River. Um, and obviously riffles, faster flowing shallow areas for spawning. Also prefers unpolluted uh, water and diverse habitat. Next slide, please. So you can see there's a classic tributary of the Berg River. Um, that's what uh, a river should look like, a little stream look, should look like in summer in the southwestern Cape. Um, you can see those of you know your uh, riparian zones pretty well. That's, that's a pristine riparian zone, uh, nice uh, restios, uh, various shrubs that uh, require uh, th their feet to be wet, so to speak. And you'll find, although the water is quite shallow, you can see a lot of rocks, a lot of cover for fish. The riparian zone very important there. Um, and in, in terms of providing shade and also a source of food for the fish. And in a stream like this, you'll find a lot of galaxias, a lot of Cape Kerpa, a lot of uh, River Rectum. And you can see what it looks like underwater. If you uh, have the uh, pleasure of uh, snorkeling in such areas. And that's maybe something that uh, one could look at with the friends is actually going up to the Bitter River uh, in Bainscliff, if you are interested. And uh, then you could have the pleasure of snorkeling amongst red fins. Um, and it's an absolutely wonderful thing to do in the summer to actually see these little jewels of the Fainbos in, in that river. Um, next slide. Uh, okay, so there is, a, this is actually a, uh, a tributary of the Breda, but it shows very clearly, this is the type of habitat, the beautiful underwater photo there of what you see in a pool like this, uh, lovely clear water, and there's a school of Vitfus, are they wanting the bigger pools? And that's the reason why they're endangered because what you find in the bigger pools of the main stem now are they full of bass, catfish, carp, and uh, it's not a very nice welcoming environment anymore for uh, whitefish. So uh, yeah, that's um, habitat requirements for uh, a larger supplement like the whitefish. Uh, next slide. So unfortunately, if you look at the Berg River system, um, <laughs> it's actually quite a diverse system now in terms of freshwater fish, but most of the fish in it are alien. So I'll use my uh, uh, mouse there just to show you the species. That's Mozambique tilapia, uh, found elsewhere in South Africa, but not, um, not naturally in the Fainbos area, not naturally in the Western Cape. Smallmouth bass uh, on the, uh, that's right. Uh, that's a North American fish, predatory fish, brought in for angling purposes. For low smallmouth bass, carp, um, uh, Eurasian fish, brought also in for angling. Unfortunately, carp are pretty notorious for causing uh, major uh, declines in water quality because of their bottom feeding habits, they make clear waters muddy. Uh, to the uh, left of the carp, bluegill sunfish, uh, they were brought in as a fodder fish for the bass. So uh, very different times back then. Uh, we're talking about the 30s, 40s, 1950s, when the obsession was to uh, stock rivers and dams with as many fish species as possible uh, in terms of fish species suitable for the waters. And some of you might have gone to Yonkazuk, uh, outside Stellenbosch. Uh, the Cape Department of Nature Conservation had a huge fish hatchery there that brought these species and bred them, mass produced them and stocked them all over the place uh, through its inland fisheries section. Uh, uh, to the right of the bluegill is mosquito fish. It's a very small little species. So um, uh, mosquito problems, <laughs> don't get your native fish, your indigenous fish to eat the mosquitoes. We need to bring something from North America to do it. Unfortunately, even this little species 
can have major problems because it eats the baby galaxies um, and baby uh, indigenous fish. They are highly predatory on larval fish. To the right is a banded tilapia from, found elsewhere in South Africa, elsewhere in Africa, um, brought into the Western Cape as a fodder fish for bass and uh, found the Berg River much to its liking. Below the bass, uh, those of, uh, many of you will have seen this fish now, very happy in the Lesbeck, uh, also happy in the Berg River system, sharp tooth catfish, found elsewhere in South Africa, not indigenous to the Fynbos, uh, and uh, but are very hardy, adaptable species, fast growing, and growing up to 30, 40 kilograms in weight. So um, a super predator. And then to the um, the left of the catfish, the rainbow trout. Okay, and that's found in the upper reaches of the berg, um, and also very sensitive to uh, water temperatures and wanting unpolluted water for survival. So uh, lots of invasive fish in the berg, and uh, uh, yeah, I, unfortunately I can't see the text very well because my face is uh, covering the text, but hopefully you can, you uh, you guys can see it. Great. Okay, next slide. So just to show you how bad the situation is, um, native fish, uh, that's, uh, this is, uh, uh, if you look at the top there, uh, sorry, at the bottom of the slide, you'll see the Berg River Dam. If you bring your pan right down there, that's the Berg River Dam, correct? And then as you, uh, the front shook's very close to there, and then you go down the river, all the way to the estuary there. Um, that's right, that's the sea there, so it's uh, very simplified. But the, the point of this is to show you how much ground has been lost to invasive fish. Those white areas are dominated by invasive fish. If you go and do a fish survey in any of those areas, you, <laughs> you will be very lucky to catch a burger of a redfin. You won't catch a burger of a redfin. Uh, you might catch, well, we think the whitefish actually went extinct. I mean, this was a fish in the 30s and 40s that was called the whitefish pest because the whitefish were competing with trout for food. And uh, it's just actually amazing how times have changed. So um, that's why bass were put into the Berg River to control the whitefish and they did such a successful job of it that Cape Nature thought uh, that in the 1990s that whitefish had likely disappeared from the Berg River system. Um, where we find the indigenous fish, the native fish, are in the uppermost reaches of tributaries, uh, often above barriers where there are no trout, there are uh, no bass, no catfish. Um, so, yeah, it's a it's a very worrying situation. Um, I think, uh, yeah, Karen, you with the uh, city of Cape Town, above Vemazook Dam, are some very very important streams that flow into Vemazook Dam that are full of Berg River redfin. It's probably the global strong stronghold now of Berg River redfin. Uh, some of those rivers do have trout, but fortunately they get very warm in summer, and the trout actually then leave those rivers to go down to the dam, and that's when the uh, redfin uh, are spawning and the uh, small fish are growing up. So, uh, yeah, you can move on to the next slide. The invasive fish, although they're the number one threat, and that's been shown by a red list assessment of Southern Africa's aquatic fauna, um, number one threat to the uh, indigenous fish in the Fainbos biome, the native fish of the Fainbos biome, are, are on bays of fish. There are, however, other major threats. You can see there on the left, uh, and this is quite often uh, what we find if we go and do fish surveys, where the river leaves the mountainous area, the first farm has got a weir on the river and withdraws the entire summer flow from the river. You can imagine uh, what can survive on that stream, nothing. And it gets so bad that at the end of the summer, even the riparian vegetation dies because there's no water. 
So um, that is on, unfortunately a legacy of the old Water Act. Uh, the new Water Act is far more environmentally friendly, uh, but you know we have these problems. Um, weirs are a problem and dams, especially if the dams are on the river in terms of migrating fish. Um, we don't, if there were still lots of whitefish in the burger remain stand, then the weirs and dams on the river could very well have quite a negative effect on those fish. Invasive plants, you can see the main, uh, the main picture there, that's of the Berg River and along the uh, river banks, lots of wattle, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, wattle, uh, pines, blue gums, uh, Spanish reed, all invasive plants that uh, are sucking up precious water, uh, precious summer flows in the river. And also they're replacing the uh, native riparian plants. But uh, on a positive note, the Berg River Improvement uh, Project, which the Department of Environmental Affairs and Development Planning in the Western Cape is leading, has been a magnificent effort along the Berg River. Uh, those of you who know the river from Franchut down to Paul, uh, 10 years ago, that, the river banks were just covered with invasive plants. If you cross the, the river on the way to Franchuk, um, have a look up and downstream and the river bank is clear. And a lot of money has been spent uh, replanting palm meat, replanting indigenous plants that used to occur there. Um, and then you can see there the uh, water pollution, that is a huge problem. Um, and it's an increasing problem because of failing wastewater treatment plants. Um, you know, if that wastewater treatment plant is discharging raw, raw sewage into the river, that's like putting um, <laughs> chlorine into the river for uh, indigenous fish that are highly sensitive to pollution. You know, you can have major, major impacts. And we've had fish kills. And then there are diseases, which uh, I think Karen, you know of, uh, in terms of sunflay, um, uh, koi herpes virus that got in there, I think. And I don't know if EUS is there. There are new diseases that have come in that can also affect the indigenous fish. So those are just touching on some of the threats there. Next photo, I mean, next slide, sorry. So this is a, a, a report that came out in 2011. Um, any people that work with uh, rivers and uh, you know, planning issues around rivers should get hold of this uh, NFEPA report, National Freshwater Ecosystem Prior Priority Area report. Sandby has it. Um, and what's, this has been done for South Africa. And this is uh, the Berg River system. And where you've got subquaternary areas, little mapped areas with blackfish and redfish, that is where there are threatened fish species. So you can see, if you look at the Cape Peninsula, there are areas that are seen as priorities for fish conservation because they've got threatened fish species. So the Berg River, there's a number of uh, subcatchments with redfish. Those are areas where there are Berg River redfin, that's an endangered species. So obviously those would be priorities for fish conservation. So just to introduce this product to you, it's a very important uh, planning product that came out in 2011 and uh, Sandby is in the process of updating these maps now. Next slide. So getting now from the Berg to the Lesbiak. So um, there are two, well, I've, I've got a question mark. We are aware at the moment of two native freshwater fishes in the Lesbiak River. And that is the Cape Kerper which are present in extremely low numbers. I, I did a, a, a rather quick survey with Karen. I don't know how long ago that was, Karen. Probably four or five years ago now. It might even be longer. Time flies. And literally, they are hanging on down in the Hartley Vale area. Um, you know, we looked up. They, they're not in the river below Kirsten Bosch. Uh, Cape Kerper likes slightly deeper pools. So they like the, the, the bigger pools in the lower river, but unfortunately those pools are full of 
uh, invasive fish and obviously their water quality problems down there. And then we've got the Cape Calaxius, which is very plentiful in the river uh, in the upper reaches. If you go to Kirstenbosch, uh, below Kirstenbosch, you can go and look into the water, Sabella. I'm sure you've seen uh, lots of uh, small fish in, in the river. That's the Cape Calaxius. Um, and the uh, popular, uh, as I've said, there are potentially up to 14 species now that are in the process of being described across the Fainbos. And the one in the Lisbeck that is quite abundant is shared with a number of other rivers in the peninsula towards the Lawrence River. So it's quite a widespread lineage. Now, when I was with Tyron and, uh, and previously, I caught a Galaxias, which, funny enough, in the lower reaches, which looks different to the one in the upper reaches. And um, I, I, it's vitally important, actually, that we get those fish looked at by uh, Dr. Albert Chacona at Sire, because it is possible there is a third species in the least bit, which would make it quite interesting. Whether that Galaxias is only found in the least bit, I don't know. It could be a more of a lowland uh, pop uh, uh, taxon, which is also found in some of the other uh, rivers around the peninsula. So there you can see um, the least bit catchment. Uh, and you all know that very well. And uh, certainly the upper reaches from what I've seen are uh, very definitely in the best ecological condition, but they are, uh, by, I think the only parts of the uh, least bit that can be regarded as pristine are those reaches in Kirsten Bush. You've got a, a, a catchment which is near natural, uh, very few invasive plants, uh, flows in, uh, in the river there, the water quality, excellent. Um, but uh, yeah, certainly as one goes down the river and you're going into um, a very built up part of Cape Town, uh, you, it's quite normal to see some impacts coming in. Next slide. So I'm nearly finished. I think I've got two more slides. So yeah, again, just like the Berg, <laughs> not just uh, native fish present in the Lisbeck. Uh, you've seen there Mozambique tilapia, banded tilapia, the mosquito fish, carp, and sharp tooth catfish. And they are mainly found in the uh, Hartley Vale area downstream. Um, these fish like uh, uh, pools, they like a lot of cover, they like depth. And uh, in the case of the Mozambique tilapia, the carp and the catfish, they get big. Uh, when I was staying at Cape Town, I actually used to fish the least bit at Hartley Vale, and I remember the one day I caught a carp of at least four kilograms. They're a big carp, carp on the river there, and I know there is some fishing. Um, and I, I actually made the point there on the right in my text uh, that there is some recreational fishing going on, and I think some subsistence fishing too. So, Bella, I don't know how many uh, there, there are no doubt of some people that catch the catfish and carp and eat them. Um, and there's no problem with that. Um, you know, it's probably a good thing um, because you don't want too many catfish and carp on the river uh, from a water quality perspective. Rainbow trout, interestingly, the old Cape Department of Nature Conservation and an Inland Fisheries Department, probably from 1910 to 19, probably to the early 1980s, stocked rainbow trout on an annual basis into the Lisbeck River. It was quite popular. Uh, I don't know if there are any friends of the Lisbeck that remember uh, those times with trout being stocked in the river. Some of you might even caught trout. Um, but I think the Lisbeck, I don't know if trout ever successfully bred in the Lisbeck. Um, I think it's probably a bit too warm uh, and a bit too small in its upper reaches to sustain a breeding population of trout. So that's just a bit of interesting history. One mustn't just look at the river as it is now. There's a reason why the river is as it is. Right. Um, so. We can go on to the next slide. 
So what I did, and Karen, I'm sure you would probably like to get your hands on that report. Uh, I prepared a report for Cape Nature when I was there on priority rivers for fish conservation in the Berg water management area. Um, and um, I looked at all, I showed you that in FEPA map with those uh, little sub catchments which have got threatened fish. So I looked at each and every one of those catchments and I uh, prepared a map of it with uh, key features of, of that catchment and then a little table. So I'm going to go through this. This is the table for the least bit. Okay. Now, <laughs> it's one of those interesting things. The Lisbeck is seen as a important fish area, but I must be honest with you, I don't know why it was depicted as an important fish area because um, from what I've read and from what I've been told, generally you become a, an important fish area if you've got threatened fish in the catchment. And I'm not aware that Galaxias that's in the catchment, as far as I know, is not a threatened Galaxias. The Cape Kerpa um, is, is not a threatened species. And as I say, if there is that third Galaxias, um, I don't even think that Galaxias has been looked at taxonomically yet. So it's an interesting one. Um, and it's quite good for, for the least peak that it's got a little bit of the, uh, the status. But I don't know if it's going to keep the status going forward because we've got to obviously look at all the rivers nationally and they've got to be uh, scored against uh, certain criteria. But you can see the fish that were historically present, uh, Escapensis, Cape Kerpa, G. zebratus. As I've said there, the Galaxias lineage that's common there is also found in the Diesel River and Hart Bay, the Silver Mine River, the Lawrence River, and the Silver Storm River. And that's uh, a paper that Wissart uh, produced in 2006. So those two species that were historically present are still present, but I'm very worried about the Cape Kerpa and the East Peak. And I'm also worried if there is that third Galaxias that likes the lower reaches, that's where the least Peak's in serious trouble. And you know that, I'm not telling you any uh, news. The, the low reaches have got major water quality problems and they've got big problems with invasive fish, uh, which enjoy eating things like uh, catfish will happily eat Cape Kerpa and, and, and your Galaxias will be eaten by any, any small fish and even larger fish. So um, as I say, the, the river has actually got quite a long stretch with uh, essentially uh, just native fish. Uh, all the way from Kirstenbosch down to Newlands. Uh, we only find the invasive fish lower down where the pools get bigger. And I've talked about the invasive fish present. The, uh, the alien fish threat is very severe in the low reaches. Water abstraction does not seem to be a big problem in the least bit. Whenever I'm there, yes, it's not the same flow as it was uh, pre-European settlement, but um, it's still is uh, there's still reasonable flow, even, even in March. Um, the channelization, that's a huge problem. I mean, I saw pictures there with Sabella's presentation. Uh, it's not friendly for fish when a river runs through a concrete canal. There's no habitat. Uh, it's uniform, there's no cover, there's no food. It's not a friendly place for fish. And if, I think we looked in the one area, Karen, where there was a little bit of bulrush hanging into the water and there were a few little galaxias that were there because there was a little bit of cover for them. Um, uh, alien plant problems, uh, I was very worried to see, I think it was wild ginger uh, and, and various other garden plants spreading into the, next to the Lisbeck up in Newlands uh, at the, in, the, in the park there. And I think one has to keep a, you know, some of these, even that elephant, elephant's ear, that is a huge problem. You can't leave that plant to take over because it shades the river, it takes away habitat for indigenous fish. It's not good for aquatic insects, for the whole web of life on the river. That is not a good thing to have. 
Um, and then pollution, big problem in the low, low river. Um, yes, uh, Kevin, uh, those fish are excellent indicators of the, of the health of the least bear. Um, as we, uh, uh, some of the catchments in formerly protected area in the Table Mountain National Park, which is great. That's probably why the river is still flowing nicely because the upper reaches are basically pristine. Um, uh, and we know there's quite a lot of rain in the Newlands, <laughs> Newlands area, which keeps everything ticking over. Um, and then, as I say, the management steps taken to improve the river. You guys are carrying on. It's great that you've got that funding. Um, and it needs, yeah, uh, you know, I just think it always saddens me if I look at the state of urban rivers in South Africa. I mean, if you go and look at urban rivers and the amount of uh, attention given to them, they are loved in the UK. They are loved in parts of the USA. People love rivers. You know, they want to walk along, alongside rivers. Uh, the, you know, a, a, a healthy river, I mean, I'm an aquatic scientist and I love fish. I'm passionate about them. A healthy river is a wonderful place to be. And, uh, but a river that's covered with litter, uh, where the water smells, you know, and it's, it's an ongoing fight. And I really admire your group for fighting the hard fight and uh, keep it up. Um, so that's that table. Uh, Kyron, I'll share that report with you. So you can, uh, it's not a secret document, but um, it's quite a, quite a heavy read. Next slide, I'm nearly finished. So recommendations for fish as I see them. I think the river would benefit from a comprehensive fish survey from Kirstenbosch to Hartleyville. Um, you know, where, you know, when I was with you, Kyron, we looked at three or four areas. I think it would be quite good to maybe have, uh, spend a bit more time, you know, go and, uh, maybe spend two days in the river, use maybe a few more methods, fight nets. And, and uh, the idea then is to look at fish distribution and population status. And, uh, and obviously the main focus is on your native species. I mean, you know, one mustn't be too worried about carp and catfish. They're highly tolerant species, uh, they'll, they'll be, they'll be the last fish to disappear <laughs> on the least peak. I think that question, you know, with that comprehensive fish survey, if we, uh, if one finds Galaxias uh, in the lower reaches, uh, like we did, I think we only got one or two. Um, certainly those fish need to go to Grahamstown, uh, to Dr. Chakona, uh, for him to confirm if they are different. Um, and yeah, I've said there, Cape Kerpa, um, very rare. Um, and we've talked about that, Karen. I, I don't know who's got the little uh, ponds that have been prepared. Um, but it's my proposal. That's great. That one tries to get five to seven fish. Sometimes you're lucky, you know, you can uh, pull some nets and you might get 15, 20 fish. But I think one it would be a good idea to get them into a dedicated pond, get them to breed Cape Kerp and breed very, very well in garden ponds because they like that type of environment, providing there's some cover for them, etc., uh, etc. Et and then one could stock the juveniles into suitable pools. And I, I certainly think one should actually put them slightly higher up in the river, um, Newlands, where that swimming uh, pool is. Uh, that public pool, public bars, there's some nice pools on the river there. It'd be quite good to maybe get them slightly higher up. I'm sure they were there historically, um, but with all the changes to the river, they, they disappeared. But you'll need to get a permit to actually move the Cape Kerpa from the river into the pond and then back into, uh, uh, into the river. But I think with a little bit of a motivation, I can't see why this is going to be uh, a big problem. Um, 
Flow appears to be good in the river, but water quality is a, and I, uh, it was good to see Sabela's presentation. It's it just, it's an ongoing problem. And one must uh, keep it in the media. If there any pollution spills, uh, get the media involved. It's always, <laughs> it's always a good idea. It's not such a nice idea when the heat's turned on you, but um, the media can play a very positive role. Um, and your partners in terms of uh, drawing attention, the public's attention to the river. And then invasive non-native plants, uh, you know, high rainfall areas around Newlands, you can't leave it. You can just see if you leave it for six months, 12 months, what it looks like. So it's an important job to keep that five meters next to the riverbank clear of invasive plants and, and actually look at replantings, because if you leave it with Kukuyu, something's going to climb in there very quickly. So I think that's the end of my presentation. Thanks for uh, your patience and uh, staying awake. I think we're all a bit tired and uh, looking forward to supper. I think uh, that is the last one, yeah. So I don't know if there are any questions. Thank you. Dean, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was most fascinating, especially the, the bits about the least beak. I know that we, we have been in discussion about the, the various indigenous fish species and uh, particularly the Sandelia, the, the Kerpa. Um, but yeah, I think that was most illuminating to our members. And yeah, I think there were a few questions from the, the chat. Uh, let me just go through them. Um, uh, Kevin Winter did ask um, your opinion on clearing invasive species uh, and particular plants on the Berg River, uh, which has caused some further deterioration downstream in the water quality. Um, now, because there are no, no plant defenses, even though they're invasive species, they're obviously still fulfilling a role. Um, he says water quality is now permanently hypereutrophic in the section of the river difficult one to argue, but is there an, an improve in habitat as, as a result of recent interventions or not? You know, the problem with the Berg is um, it's decades of neglect. Um, and, you know, what it actually needs, you know, I can tell you millions and probably more than 10 million rand have been spent by the provincial government to try and improve the state of the river. Um, and look, with, uh, with river rehabilitation, there is the right way to do it and the wrong way to do it. And generally what you want to do is you want to start from upstream areas and move down, downstream. And you want to uh, if you've got uh, invasive plants, you want to go into the lightly invaded areas first because you've still got native plants there uh, that need help. Um, so I think the, the, the thing with the Berg is it's going to require ongoing attention and, and, and effort and a lot more money still spent on it. And... Uh, Look, I've got my thoughts about that. Uh, what I would like to see is for when water's drunk and uh, comes out of a tank and uh, comes out of a tap and drunk in Cape Town, there should be a little levy that goes back to the catchment that produces the water, um, which would then fund easily any rehabilitation project. And I know there is uh, 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 work being done nationally in terms of these strategic water resource areas in terms of uh, making sure there's funding for re river rehabilitation work. I know they have probably made mistakes in terms of replantings, in terms of the way they've done it along the Berg, but you know if you don't do things uh, you can't learn and I think there are, there are areas which have been successful. I've, I've personally seen presentations where the uh, uh, riparian community uh, it has recovered very, very nicely. But, you know, the problem with the Berg, it's a long river. You know, if you look from Fontchuk down to the sea, I don't know how long that is. But it's, uh, you know, uh, it requires a lot of work. Um, and 
I, I think what's quite good is the, it's also being looked at from a research perspective. Uh, there are various researchers that are looking at the, that was a point I made in the Bird River Improvement uh, Project. You know, you, you're going in there, you're doing all these actions, but where's your monitoring? Is, is the action actually successful or not? You know, and uh, so I don't know if uh, I've talked in a roundabout way, and it's the same thing with any uh, project on the on the NISP. It's it's it, uh, you don't want you to involve UCT, UWC, uh, involve the students, uh, providing there's a concerted, uh, and maybe one must look at particular areas of the river where you where you do have a rehabilitation plan, um, and goals and objectives and a vision, and you you actually maybe forget about the lower reaches. Um, which are the reaches which are, uh, you know, you must look at the parts of the river that can be more easily saved with, with less money rather than huge amounts of money. Thank, thanks, Dean. I mean, I think uh, from Friends of the Least Big, we actually have uh, surprisingly close ties with the Berg River management, um, just given our previous managers, there was Jason Mingo and even our yes. chairperson. I believe, uh, Phil, you are a little bit more involved with the Berg River from the provincial government perspective. Um, but it's interesting how the lessons that we learn on the least bit can be applied to the bigger river systems um, in our catchment. Um, I just wanted to quickly chat uh, or touch on that, uh, the Cape Kerpa Leesbeek issue. Um, you mentioned the ponds that are being prepared. Those are my ponds. I, I at my nature reserve, am, and I am preparing some fish ponds, which my intention is to do a fish rearing project for the Sandelia in the Leesbeck as our first target. Um, and then using that as a case study to move to our protected areas following that, um, which is a very exciting project for us. We, we believe that there are many available niches left behind by the rainbow trout, which are no longer stocked, where the Kerpa could quite easily easily um, fit into. So I think we need to move quite quickly on that given the, the threatened population in the least spec. I do know that the genetics are quite similar with the, the Dyser River in Heart Bay, but first choice is obviously the, the lower reaches. So that's very interesting. I just wanted to go through a couple more, see if there are any more questions here. Um, Kevin mentioned an, an, another issue with, you know, looking at invasive species versus pristine habitat and how those definitions impact on your development applications. In, in your experience, the alien vegetation, how does that impact on your water quality and your, your aquatic ecosystems and um, whether that relates to the ecosystem health? And maybe you could just touch on that briefly. Yeah, look, you know, I've, I've spent 29 years uh, visiting rivers around the province and there is just no doubt in my mind. You know, if, if I go up into the mountains and it's a pristine catchment, pristine riparian zone, I'm happy to drink the water in the river. Mm. Um, but when that catchment now becomes full of pines, bottles, uh, other invaders, the, the problem is that they are, you will find when those rivers flood, badly. The trees often fall over and then they damage the bank and you will find that the water quality is still good but you've got a, uh, you, the, the problem is you've got a different source of nutrients coming into the river from the invasive vegetation um, for the aquatic invertebrate community as well. So you know, you you actually are having an, an effect um, because you're replacing native vegetation with non-native vegetation. And look, this hasn't, uh, as it is, we don't know the aquatic invertebrates from, uh, there's no river in South Africa where we know, where we know the full complement of biodiversity of the aquatic invertebrates. So it's actually quite difficult to actually look at that group, and if you look at diversity compared to the fish, the Feinbos, funnily enough, although it doesn't have a lot of fresh water fish diversity compared to, let's say, a river flowing through the Fruga National Park, um, 
the aquatic invertebrate diversity for some of the groups like caddisflies actually goes up in the fanbos. Very high levels of intimacy, just like the fish and the fanbos plants. Um, so you've got a lot of aquatic invertebrate diversity, and there's a lot of mind, mind that when you replace that riparian zone with wattles, and you often, the problem with invasives, you, you will have a monoculture. So you can have elephant ears, just elephant ears. <laughs> you cannot expect a diverse riparian zone that's native, that's replaced by elephant ears or black wattle. You, you will not have the same aquatic invertebrate community. Here, yeah, the water is uh, still probably fit to use, but what you, 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 you must have lost something quite substantial. Okay. Uh, unless, are there any more questions from the, from the floor? Um, um, hello, it's Nikki Sparks here. I don't know if you can hear me. We can hear you, yes. Hi, I watched a very interesting program a while ago. There was a huge drop in the clownfish population. Um, it was an American program, and these fish were being caught for, for pets. So they um, involved a couple of schools, and they gave these schools each a little tank, and they were able to breed lots and lots of clownfish. And then they were reintroduced into the areas where there was a huge depletion. So maybe that could um, help your Kirpa population. Thanks. I, I no. think that. No, sorry, Dean. I'll, I'll, Bill, I'll let you answer. Yeah, look. Um, sorry, I just no, wanted to show quite, the, yeah, that. Looks good. That looks prepared, good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you've, have you, you've obviously got quite a lot of rocks inside it. Yeah, not, we're, we're, we're sourcing the rocks now uh, and okay. getting the plants together. Yeah. Okay. Look, the person to uh, speak to at Cape Nature is Martin Yordan, Dr. Martin Yordan. So I'll give you all the uh, contact details. Um, and you'll need to, you'll need to win her over um, with this proposal. And what I would uh, suggest, and I, I'm, I, I'm confident there shouldn't be a problem with the proposal. Um, look, there, there's certainly not enough Cape Kerpa to spread them out to fish tanks and all that sort of thing. And there's also, you know, the problem with spreading it out to fish tanks is uh, you can actually, unfortunately, also then lose a bit of control in terms of the fate of those fish. And when you're dealing with so, so few Cape Kerpa, uh, I think from Cape Nature's perspective, um, they would rather it go to um, one place, um, you know, which is very controlled. Um, the problem as well of spreading the fish out as well, you can have disease issues, you can increase the dis disease risk. So um, what I would suggest you do, Tyron, is prepare, it doesn't have to be a 40 page proposal, just prepare a two to three page proposal. I'm happy to have a look at it. And uh, then, um, you know, send it to, uh, send it to Martin uh, with a request for a permit to, to, to catch, you know, maybe if you can, up even up to 20 fish. Yeah. Um, I think as an absolute minimum, you'd want five. Hmm. Um, and then you don't want to be visited by a cormorant or a kingfish. Yes, yes. <laughs> Um, you, you, so a very important thing I do, I've got a water feature at home. You must cover that water feature with uh, fishing gut, with nylon. It's extremely effective. So you basically do it in a zigzag pattern right across. Can you, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, yes. And what you find is that the birds fly over, if they see that line, I mean, I've had my fish pond and the goldfish are not very clever animals. I've had the goldfish cleared out because a cormorant came, flew over, saw the little red thing swimming around and went into the pond and ate every last goldfish. I was then advised about the fishing line. It doesn't look so wonderful, but you put the fishing line across just three strands in terms of a small water feature and the birds will not land in the, because they're scared of getting caught in the line. 
So it works very effectively. And I would definitely, you know, those Cape Kirk, but could be you only get six or seven. They're very precious. And you, you know, you don't want, uh, you don't want platanus climbing in there, eh? And you don't want to be visited by a giant kingfish or something like that. So I, I would also add some palmit. Get some palmit. Uh, put, put the palmit into a big water uh, plant pot. Uh, and then you plant it in, in rocks. And uh, it does, obviously the, the, the head of the plant must be from the stem. It must be above the water. Mm. And, uh, you know, uh, put as much cover in as possible. Um, and uh, to give the fish a chance. Firstly, you won't have to feed the fish because the, the pond will generate the mosquitoes and whatnot, its own food. And uh, there'll be cover when the Cape Kerper breed, there'll be a lot of cover for the juvenile fish. But I'm happy to come and have a look at it as well. Um, Did, you know, uh, I've kept fish all my life. So I know, I know the husbandry side of fish. Okay, well, well thank, thank you so much for your insights. It was a, it was a thoroughly uh, informative and yeah, and, and just really illuminating talk. And I, I hope that a lot of our members this evening have learned a bit more about the indigenous fish that we have. Um, and then we'll obviously be sharing this on our social platforms um, and hopefully you'll get a, a bit of a broader reach as well. Um, Dean, uh, you know, as Phil mentioned earlier with, with the, the pandemic, obviously we'd like to hand you a bottle of wine now. Um, <laughs> However, we, we have keep it, sent keep it, keep it. We have sent a small yeah, I will I will keep the wine for myself. Thanks. <laughs> um, um, but we ha we have sent a small thank you gift. Uh, you can check your inbox, you'll you'll find uh, it's sitting there. So thank you so much for taking time out of your, your fresh retirement to to address us. Um, yeah. and certainly this Kerper project is very exciting for me personally, and um, it's something that we can discuss uh, offline in, in the months ahead. So Definitely. thank you very much and yeah. Yeah, no, nice to nice to have had twenty five people uh, listening in. Um, really great. Thank you very much. And best wishes going forward, friends. Thank you. Thank um, you very much. Um, thank you very much, Dean, for that uh, fascinating presentation. Yes, we'd like to remain in contact with you and and take the certainly the Kerpa project forward, uh, and also any other advice you are willing to give us will we'll gra gratefully receive. Thank you so much. Um, I think, oh, thanks. I'm, I, I think that all that's left for me to do is thank everyone who has made the time to come in on this meeting. And uh, it's been great to share an evening with you all again, even though this year not in person. And so I can't, unfortunately, this time now send you on to all the wonderful snacks that we normally have provided. Um, and drinks for that matter. But uh, I hope that you all have snacks and drinks of your own making in your own homes that you can now go and enjoy. Um, and really appreciate your uh, participation in uh, Friends of the Lee Speak AGM. Hope to see you all next year in person. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks also, Nick, very much for organizing and for getting everything going and recording this meeting. Much appreciated. We'll see the rest of the committee next month. Cheers, everybody. Kari, you have yes, something yes. you want to mention? You're muted. Not often. <laughs> um. I just wanted to ask, so the, the links that are in the, in the chat, you're going to extract those and send them to people. Yeah, I did, I did mention that in the group. I will put those links for Sabella's and my talk um, into the same email cluster that we are, the RSVP cluster. So those links will all go out. Uh, but you're also welcome to just have a look on YouTube. If you search for Friends of the Least Pick, you'll find our page there. We don't have many videos and they're all well labeled. So go ahead and just look, look in at uh, the YouTube if you want to see our presentations. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you.